How does humanity's behavior fit into a cosmic structure? Are we the behavior of the cosmos in one moment? Or do our personal stories overpower the impersonal position, the impersonal position of phenomena? Okay, I just had to grab the charger real quick, guys. Let's begin. And right, let's continue. Where to begin? See, guys, the reason I titled it Behavior of cosmic structure is because we are uh, at first we at first find ourselves in the cosmos we find that our consciousness our free will whatever it is that is conceiving uh, uh, we are conceiving as a mind is functioning in is functioning in an individual domain we feel we're separate for the world that's why we are in the world do you know 
but in actuality, when we go really far back, it seems that we were the extension of the world that became conscious of itself. That means there was a state. There was a state between this current way that our behaviors and personalities are standing that prior to being a person, we were nature's movement. So evolutionary-wise, you won't believe how much collective movement uh, you have memories of. Now, the concept of a memory, I got, <laughs> I'll get into it, uh, I think, midway through the talk. But um, uh, my atten I want to bring your attention to how there is a cosmos here. It has structure, and because it has structure, we identify behavior. Now, behavior tends to follow rules, if you notice. That means every per person, whether they like it or not, they are following some rules some certain manners, as if life is a sort of, uh, uh, every day is its own ceremony. So to study the behavior of cosmic structure means to kind of realize how cosmic structure is being a mind for itself. One of the most profound metaphysical debates uh, philosophical debates is how can an electron have a mind and so the design <coughs> the design of the mind is actually how attention is present this is the secret of meditation discover the presence of your attention and the world will turn behind your eyes before it turns in front of it Oh my god, uh, I forgot to put the C, so the subtitle says Dain of Darkness. <laughs> it's the dance of darkness and light. Um, you see, because we are dynamic creatures, that means, how would I say it, like, if a tree could be as conscious as a human being, um, it would see the limitations of its movement. We human beings have certain limitations, of course. Every uh, manifest phenomena has, certain, it has a sort of conditional existence to its experience. But we human beings, we move. And first, we physically moved on the surface of the planet. Then, then, something very unique happened. Uh, uh, through the kind of um, uh, invention of language in man's mind, the ability to separate, identify, distinguish, and in some sense restructure. So we have to acknowledge first that the human intelligence has walked a long road. Our ancestors did not live for nothing. They actually lived so our eyes could look at the world too. And the thing is, when technology becomes more exciting than nature, uh, people are going to try to be gods. That means rather than... The thing was, guys, and let me tell you this, I'm, for me, <laughs> I'm a very, I'm, I stand in a very unique position. Um, I used to have tons, tons, tons of... Uh, uh, beliefs and sort of ways that I, I felt the universe was only this way, but eventually I stopped taking my, uh, my convictions that seriously. For me, I began to see beliefs are like leaves on a tree. They pass through the seasons. As the biological phenomena changes, uh, the subjective phenomena will change as well. But there is something here in every moment of being, in every moment where there is an attention, it is the source of the attention. Now, I say source because I want to imply like the depth of the ocean to you. But at the same time, this, it, um, there is an inseparability of the individual activity and the cosmic activity. Once this is comprehended, meditation stops. What that means is you no longer need to go meditate based on some guru, super guru telling... <laughs> Do you know, uh, Swami Krishnananda even says this. He says when, when in some sense, uh, when the person realizes the inseparability of individual activity and cosmic activity, uh, collective activity, uh, then suddenly 
there is no longer a need to free an individual. Once you see your relationship with this cosmic structure, you realize you're structured in a part of it. Even your eyes are in a unique way structured to see it in a certain way. And that's the fascinating part of it. So the behavior of cosmic structure is the story of man and the story of man is the dance between darkness and light. It is the dance between survival and in some sense uh, uh, the lack of it. Now if we want to say survival is the only point, we ignore minds. We ignore a lot of creativity. If we all are just competing and fighting all the time, we will never see the other side. You know, society, just like a tree, has shadows. <laughs> and so the shadow of the tree does not give fruit, but the tree, the actual tree, gives fruit. And so we are dwelling in the shadows of civilization. 2019 is not a year of greatness, is a year where greatness is being noticed. Is being noticed that we have to, not have to, it's not like a do or die situation. It's one of those things where you're like, okay, I'm alive. And so is 8 billion other members of my species. And we have all built a civilization of some sorts. You know, the contributions of many human beings has designed the, wo uh, the roads we walk on. And so what is the point? What is the point of a species? So that means uh, once the person has lived enough for themselves, they get bored. <laughs> You could go, like right now, imagine like you were the, the richest man on earth. You had everything. You literally had no challenges. With one snap of your finger, for example, uh, all your enemies were eradicated. You are so rich. Imagine. Just imagine. Now, what do you do? After you've reached the top of the mountain, you see, oh my God, the whole species is trying to get to the top. But what is this top? Is this top a sort of a climbing a, a mountain of bills? Or is it trying to recognize that we are alive in this form once? We are tempo temporary creatures. Money and getting rich is an eternal value. It's an attempt of the temporary to feel like it is eternal. But it is, it is, it is not enough. Because life, this life is not just like, things are not just given to you. There is a sort of puzzle here. In many religious texts, for example, um, I'm not that certain of the Bible, but uh, I do have a sort of confirmation of this in the um, in the Quran and the Islamic thing. I was raised by uh, till the age of seven in Iran, and Iran was a theocratical society, so I had to become really uh, alert and aware of these uh, ideas very quickly. I have this theory, which I feel I am. Um, a uh, sort of black sheep of the Abrahamic religions uh, in the sense that I feel uh, human beings cannot look through each other's eyes and therefore the, the communication that is relayed of truth changes by the communicator and so that once the attention comes to communication then suddenly new paradigms new dimensions of cosmic intelligence open up to you when i say cosmic intelligence i mean guys we don't need to have a fruity magical story to it at the same time we don't need to have a doll just like we're all a bunch of rocks in space you know a bunch of atoms in space it's not <laughs> we're on a rock in space as a bunch of atoms i mean it, it, if if we have, we can totally entertain that idea but we are not just what we see we are the seer and that is what I'm trying to revoke, because society is forgetting it. Children are judging themselves based on how much they fit into a system which they can never in some sense fit into like, they're, like the system's designers. <clears throat> that means no person, people can go in society, but no person can uh, know the game better than the game developer. And so society is a developed game, it is an activity. It is an activity that gives us a, a grand social collective uh, audience, a collective mind. So humanity is now moving where it's seeing the behavior of cosmic structure evolve to an individual position. That means I am an individual, yay. You know, and <laughs> this individual eventually came to a position 
where it is now realizing it is as individual as it sees everything else. It is like that subtle uh, consideration behind the back of your subconscious, where it's like a secret in the unconscious that the separation of the, uh, of the various elements, the various aspects of the moment, they are not separate, but they are separate to themselves. And this will be a profound revelation, not a revelation, but re realization in regards to the positioning of memory. Because if I ask you, where is language coming from? It is coming from an unknown atmosphere of mind where memory and imagination are coagulating. Which in some sense makes us feel, is reality our imagination, or is imagination, or does imagination come from our reality? And again, we are, we are thrown into, uh, we, we, we are found, we find ourselves in a road of paradox. In, in any sort of philosophical speculation of any phenomena, there will be a paradox. The paradox is important because language is founded upon duality. And if the person is trying to conceive, conceptualize a certain uh, position it will see it will it will it will see the inseparability <clears throat> what that means is the good and the bad exist codependently
Um, to continue, guys, I don't know how long I accidentally kind of muted the microphone. But, um, anyways, I'll continue. I find that what meditation, <clears throat> the mystical kind, was trying to evoke in the seeker was this notion that the person has finally wondered about the ultimate, the ultimate position of their existence and their experience. In wondering about it, they have come to a point where I say you will find the edge of the whale of thought or the language threshold. The language threshold is a very significant moment. I don't know if many people will come to this awareness, will notice the language threshold. But the language threshold is where your mind, or what we're considering, your mind, your mind is pretty much your soul's movement in a body. Your soul is your body's interpretation of the mind's origin, <clears throat> or the mind's uh, if cause. which in some sense is a speculation on an unknown factor. Don't think I'm sitting here and being like, okay, guys, I know everything about all this. It's, 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 for me, it's a fascinating, wondrous, uh, changing situation, this life. Every day I have come and my mind has had a certain expectation and suddenly the expectations were not met as if life in that moment was telling me, you human being, do not... Do not believe that this world should listen to your mind. Your mind should bow to the world. And this was the this this was this sort of wisdom was also tapped into through the ancient saying where certain sages would say, you know, the mind is a is a lousy master but a good servant. And so a servant is like a vehicle, a technology. It's an accessible technology. Okay, and I, um, what I mean by that is is that. A technology is, is something which in some sense, think of it this way. People go to work and they go and suddenly their boss comes to them and tells them something. That boss that tells them something which the employee has to urgently do, it's as if that boss has programmed the code in the mind of that employee that needs to get done by like Friday or something. You see? And so when we recognize how much of life is programmed behavior, then we suddenly wonder about the programs of the cosmic structure. We wonder about how the universe is being itself, you know? Imagine a situation, of course I'm saying this playfully and respectfully as a thought experiment, but imagine man suddenly had an audience with God and God was like, what is it man? And man was like, God. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> why did you create me? You know, and God looks at man and he's like, why did you create art when you were on earth? And man looks at God and he says, because I felt like it. And God says there. That means many, many, there are many things in motion in this cosmic playground that were not reason based. Reason is an extraction of the world. It is a, a sort of mental alignment to a sort of uh, pattern. Logic, rationality, they are important factors. We need them for the civility of civilization. However, they are also loops. It's a loop. It's as if you seeing everything and painting it with one color, you know, with one color. And I will tell you, this life is not about just an intellectual activity. There has been times where my intellect has tried to reach for the throne of uh, the divine and it has found itself kind of rejected and thrown back. And I have found moments where I would tell him I, I felt I was a slave to universal forces. 
I felt that this world is the programmer and I am just a moment of witnessing. However, after you find your true nature, you in some sense have access to nature's truths. And nature's truths are ways that the mind contains itself. And the ultimate container is no container. That means a person, tr a person trying to conceptualize the universe is like a person taking a, a, like a, a, a glass, a glass of, uh, you know, an empty glass of water and taking that glass under a waterfall. And he's like, okay, I'm going to catch the whole waterfall in this glass. Our thoughts will fall short in the magnitude of the multidimensional dynamism of existential and experiential phenomena at the same time. There is a sort of simultaneity to your nature. It's as if your mind is moving as your body is. And so what is moving? Does the body need instructions and codes of, of programs, a sort of language to move through? Does the uh, mind need a sort of physical reality to, in some sense, have a value? <clears throat> and so these speculations, they are not new. It's as if René Descartes spoke about the mind and body's dualism. You know, but it's very fascinating. You can see... Um, the imagination of the ancients were much more vast and pre uh, precise than the imagination of those now. Because now we have other factors to pay attention to. As, if the, as, the, as, as population increased and as society took shape and civilization began to take form, the forms ac accessible in civilization became more important than how the world is. So man, as man kind of stepped out of the forest and started going to work in a society, what occurred uh, uh, through the evolution of the tribal dynamic, the tribal complex, is that eventually the person considered and chose that the value of a known system is more than an unknown system. And so this is why I find the world, especially in the western part of the world, um, is in some sense partying on Fridays. It's as if most of the person's life is given to contributing to a programmed structure, and, and that program gives certain moments where the, the phenomena could experience glitches in the system. And what that means is we are trying to free our minds from the obligations of a world we don't understand or we cannot fully comprehend. So the mystics kind of knew this. It's not that, like, there, there, some people took it too extreme. When we look at Vedanta, the Vedic culture, <clears throat> ancient Indian mythology and metaphysics, what we find is that there were certain people who they thought this world was an illusion. The concept of a simulation, this world being a simulation, is not new. You know, it's like as if um, there was a man named M Michael Talbot. He wrote a book called The Holographic Universe. Um, a friend of mine was telling me about it. Unfortunately, I haven't had time to properly sit down, but I saw an interview of Michael Talbot where he was explaining his experiences, and it was as if he was, he was saying that there were certain things happening that at an early age he noticed as if this world wasn't just the room of the senses, that it's as if there are uh, hidden dimensions behind the hidden data. And what that means is like you look at a tree, you see the branches, the leaves, even the fruits, you see the trunk. But then you see as all the branches of knowledge come down to one trunk, to one moment, that one moment has its roots uh, in, in, in the soil that cannot be seen. That means people can see the branches of a tree, but they cannot see its roots unless they dig the soil. And simply we are finding that the, the way our mind is kept, and this is I'm not just saying this... Uh, uh, I'm not the first to say this, but it's that the mind people have understood, even Carl Jung's lifetime was dedicated to this, to comprehend how the unconscious influences the conscious mind. And it's very, very important to recognize this. That means our identity, our personality is like a tree that has its roots in the unknown. So your knowledge is kept by the unknown, just like how... <clears throat> the mysteries of the universe have originated in some sense the eyes of man on a rock in the middle of nowhere. So in some sense we find certain corners in our vision where they are unthinkable places. And when I say unthinkable places, that means only experience is authorized to enter, not an experience that is boxed up in thought. So Aristotle, this Greek philosopher, told us it is the sign of an educated mind to entertain 
an idea without accepting it. And so the mystical mindset was pretty much like, okay, we're going to entertain, we're in this karmic world, but, you know, <laughs> we're not going to accept it, we're going to wonder. And it's that wonder that has led to the mind's kind of reflection, the mind finding a mirror so powerful that it sees destiny to, in some sense, be the force of its will. There's this very incredible poet, mystic poet, who lived in ancient Persia. <clears throat> Not ancient, but like like he was alive 700 years ago uh, in a place called Shiraz in Iran. And of course, he was acquainted with the Sufi tradition, and Hafiz has this saying where he says, One regret, dear world, I wish not to have. I hope not to have is that I did not kiss you enough and what that means is we are all alive and that's magical and I don't want to even say magical that's the divinity the fact that existence stands to look at itself in the mirror is, is the divine principle that there is something to move that we have free will after four billion years of evolution the science project has in some sense come to this sophistication So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to turn the direction of this thought and kind of pilot it into certain, um, some of my personal subjective domains. So, um, just give me a second. <laughs> driven by forces unknown. <clears throat> Knowledge appeared as an actor on stage. This actor on the stage of reality began to wonder where the inspiration of its movement came. 
it came to realize it had certain programs, it had certain lines the actor had to say. These lines were given to it. These programs of subconscious existence were given to it. In some sense, the environment is moving the intelligence of the being. However, the free will is that factor that can interpret and take ownership for the movement of nature. And it takes ownership for the movement of nature by, in some sense, segmenting itself through time. That means this conscious moment breaks itself down to time. And once there is a past, present, future, and that straight arrow forth, we suddenly see there is a person who has various values and various moments. So memory and time, uh, without time, memory could not exist. And memory's existence has to do with the recordings of change. <clears throat> so it's kind of like, kind of noticing how the mind has access to various images of the body through various moments, but the physical body has access only to what it is now. And so to conduct the mind and body, most people think they have to conduct the body with their mind. So that's why we see uh, the self-help industry, in some sense, any book on the mind gets a sort of a unique attention. The mind has become important. It's as if we've, we've pushed out, like the secular societies of the world have pushed out the notion of God, have pushed out the notion of the supernatural, have no pushed out the notion of tran the transcendental, and yet... They're trying to wonder where excitement comes from. Mr. Within's uh, conclusion profound conclusion on the education of humanity is how experience and existence how a sort of singular existence has a multidimensional experience of itself and once there is found a sort of contentment with this multidimensionality, then arises deeper perceptions of how the cosmos moves. So what Mr. Within is saying is, dear human being, first study how the cosmos uh, is moving in your eyes, then study how the, uh, the cosmos moves your eyes. Every time I have made a mistake, Jesus. The mind seeks freedom. The body seeks pleasure. The soul is the seeker. And after the rain of thoughts comes from beyond the clouds of imagination and abstraction, the smile of the sun. Your true presence is like the sun 
your personalities are the various shadows that the light beams of your true presence personalize. Hafez is known to, uh, to share a unique imagery in his poetry where he's like, truth is the one sun, one, one singular point where all the beams of this sun are creating infinite forms. Not infinite, but you know what I mean, like endless forms. It's as if life has a mission, and that is to open the eyes of evolution on planets. And this is why I've playfully theorized, you know... <laughs> These are certain hypotheses I entertain, and in some sense, I've con I've come into unique conclu uh, I've concluded in unique ways. Unique moments in my life have led to this. But there was once where I felt that the sun is a vehicle. I felt that the sun. has a world inside. And then I've also considered that the whole universe is in a sun. <laughs> And these are the It's kind of like, again, how Attar in that quote I shared earlier says, the home we seek is in eternity. The truth that we seek is like a shoreless sea. When you see a shoreless sea, that means a, a, an unconditional condition, a condition that has no edge, therefore cannot be kept as a condition. Therefore, every moment in this changing cosmos is in some sense a performance that has never been witnessed. A person can come every day and share the same idea, but is the day the same? Is the person the same? Is their attention moving with the same brain chemistry as yesterday, or is it, is, is there, is, are there differences that if we take into account, they make our world seem like a different world? So for me, where, does, where do human beings go? After, we have, after the individual, in some sense, has attained a sort of enlightened view, when I say enlightened, I mean you've kind of become aware how light is being existence, how you are in light, a story of the world. <clears throat> so f it, it means that there has to be a sort of subtler consideration. You, the person is now their experience, rather than jumping constantly into the unknown, first wants to see what it knows. So first you got to see how you're containing the world in your eyes, and then after you have acknowledged that container, you can see beyond your own mind's effort to constantly interpret the world as, a, as the past commanded it. I remember I saw a video on YouTube. It was at the same time kind of interesting, but at the same time tragic. And it was this, I don't know, it was like some sort of commercial or some video where these kids who had been bullied when they were young, like seriously bullied when they were young, now they had become successful, like uh, fi financially successful people. <clears throat> and in the video, in the video, they were looking at, they were saying their bully's first name, and they're like, I became successful bully. And it's as if they're still trying to punch someone who punched them years ago. And that was tragic. I'm like, dude, your whole life, that bully you did, that bully was the greatest inspiration of your life. If, if like, after 40 years, like, you're, you're looking at that bully on screen and saying, yeah, bully, here you go, man. <laughs> like, what? We, we must live lives of clarity or we have no choice but to walk ignorantly. And we have to wonder about clarity. It is, it is the only thing that is left to fight for. Because if there is a chance, the world you see is not just the only world, the only world you see, the, the only world that's here. In some sense, the sight has to be recalibrated. Therefore, a process of self-inquiry must occur. Therefore, the body has come, the physical body has to come towards a sort of stillness and silence where the movement of the mind is the reality.
right now when whenever you move your body your attention go, moves as the body <clears throat> therefore you don't need abstract reality but when you're still and silent comes the wonders of the mind and if you notice something guys about failure it is the pre prevention of the successful movement of one intention that's the issue with failure a man who fails only then can recognize the design of their success and i have walked in this life especially i've been uh, my passivity and agreeableness has has made the world walk over me many times <laughs> but it all those moments where i felt there was a sort of in, inefficiency and capability and i had in some sense subjectively tortured myself because of it for many years eventually there came a day where I laughed and I cried at the same time and that was an incredible day because in that moment where I was laughing and crying it's as if tears were coming out of my eyes both of my eyes but one eye it was the tears of sorrow and in the other eye were the tears of joy and reverence and in some sense, I found myself in a moment where I was laughing at the foolishness of my past that was always here in the present. If you notice, you, you only know your mistakes after you've made them. <laughs> Have you noticed this, guys? You know, it's like you don't know your mistake unless you... That's the thing with guilt. Guilt only arises when you didn't... You knew something was going to happen and you either didn't prevent it or you did it. And so that's the thing, that you are given, uh, I don't want to say warnings, but nature displays. It, it, it's always updating you with its status. And I'm saying nature, your true nature, only from within can you uh, is truly live among all that is alive. Because all living phenomena, there is a sort of field of intelligence. That means I will tell you something fascinating, okay? Imagine this, this planet is empty, but there are, in some sense, there is a sort of field that simulates it into, into animation, which in some sense, this simulating field, this field of, the field is not a simulation, but what f it is moves as intelligence in that field of intelligence is simulated. That means man is wondering whether this life can be truly witnessed by the edge of its sight. And a new wave of exploration is going to occur. I have even seen this. I've had <coughs> very playfully visions of this, where in the future there's going to be multi-dimensional, the first multi-dimensional renaissance, the first global renaissance, the first effort that a species was like, unite and now we innovate. And comes the waves of just this, this ability to recognize that through peaceful environments comes the greatest um, uh, visions of chaos. We need world peace to see what the most chaotic is. Do you see? <laughs> we need that space to innovate. And so that's why I care for world peace. I don't care for the story of world peace. It doesn't matter what story a person tells themselves to be peaceful. I don't care about that. You know, I don't care if, if you need God to be a normal person or if you don't need God to be a normal person. It is not important for me. What it is important is how aware are you that you are being aware? And where this awareness leads is the efficient vision of your civilization. What else is there? Dear, dear listeners, challenge me on this point and tell me what else is there left? Imagine individuals reach the peak of their success. Imagine every individual was enlightened. What then? And then we see the world that is in front of us. We see how the worlds behind our eyes live to contribute to the worlds in front of it. You know, because that is the only time when Im imagination has value, when your thoughts have value, when they have a reason to live in front of your eyes. That is why the poet picks up the pen. That is why the writer, in some sense, moves. It's, it allows the free will to communicate. And that is why the mystic laughs. Because the field of intelligence is ever present but what is found in the field of intelligence motion has its limits 
a person cannot dance 24 hours. They will get tired. You know? <laughs> they will get tired and they will look at life and they will be, why am I here? And in some sense, the cosmos will become a mirror for them for the first time. I want to share with you a personal thing that happened, how I kind of got led towards um, the viewpoints that I share now. Okay? So in 2011, I was a person who, if I heard my own talks, I would be like, okay, buddy, <laughs> thanks, you know, thanks for, for, thanks for these. Uh, you know, I, I, I did not care about the idea of the soul. I did not even care about wanting to wonder about the origin or the presence of my consciousness. I didn't care. I didn't, like, I was just trying to win in a, in a game of society. I remember I had a sales job and I was totally an arrogant person. I was so existentially insensitive that I, I, it was okay for me to tackle the world. And eventually, you know what happens? <laughs> I'll tell you guys, this is, everybody knows this. Whenever you don't see the world and you live in it, those people who are aware in the present moment, they see you. It's as if this world is not in short supply of fools. And fools originate when the inner reality is just the only truth. That means it, it's like the person is only nice to you if you have the same beliefs as them. If, they, if you don't have the same beliefs, why should they be, uh, in some sense, similar to that which to them is, is part of their chaos? Because what you don't care about is the chaos, right? We want to, in some sense, uh, you try to, it's like a person trying to be good never learns from how they are bad. Never realizes that this life is not meant to be just a boring kind of, we sit in a bunker, we sit in the safe, safe house our whole life and never wonder about its depths. Our ancestors were explorers. The evolutionary urge was an exploration. As if there was a command written in the program of how existence is designed, that that program, that command was live on. Turn your life on through its clarity. Too many children are lost to idols. <clears throat> that means there was a point where idol worship was, was, uh, was stopped. There were people worshiping idols and, we're like, and people came up to and it's like, Hey man, why are you worshiping this piece of wood, this piece of rock, this, like, which you've put a feather on it and you're calling it God? Why are you worshiping this? And then uh, the idols of man's worship were broken. There are, historic, uh, uh, there, there are historic references of this. Even we find, for example, in the Islamic religion, in the Abrahamic religions, for example, Mecca, which is the primal attention point of the Muslim man of the Islamic tradition, Mecca was a house where, uh, in some sense, people had idols in it. And in some sense, Ab Abraham, Abraham broke those idols. You know, the early prophets or the early uh, awakeners of man kind of broke that. And after they broke that, you know, like I'll just share this just, just to um, validate the cultural reference. Um, there's a story that Ibrahim, this, this man of uh, vision, he, he in some sense comes and sees their people, a group of people, I guess pantheists or something, polyth polytheists. They're worshipping, uh, not polytheists, sorry, uh, pantheists. People who are worshipping natural stuff, okay? And so when I say natural stuff, like, uh, I mean like, how would I say it? Like, like stuff, like, like uh, uh, um, statues made of like natural uh, materials, you know? <laughs> And so, Abraham comes and sees all these people worshipping their own gods, all of them creating their own gods. And in some sense, Abraham suddenly, once these guys leave, breaks all the statues except one statue, you know, one idol, and puts like a kind of hammer beside that one idol. And suddenly people come back and they see all the idols broken except this one idol, and in some sense... <laughs> Ibrahim tells them, uh, they see Ibrahim standing beside the hammer and the statue, you know, and so suddenly all the people are like, Ibrahim, did you do this? Did you break our statues? And Ibrahim's like, no, this one idol, this one god suddenly picked up the hammer and broke all the other statues. 
and eventually there was a snapping out of artificial reality. And that was the effort of the religion to keep the unknown truth alive in the mind of the, uh, uh, the known false belief. So Mr. Within is trying to say this. They didn't teach this in the educational system. But they taught this in Shaolin monk schools. <laughs> because they had, they were for, Shaolin monks are introduced to Zen. You know, the greatest warriors never pick up the sword. It is that the sword finds their hand because ignorance is around. The greatest weapon is a mirror. And a mirror is a remembrance of a state prior to the ignorant data uh, occupying the whole attention. Now, I want to focus on a bit on a sort of psychological viewpoint on this, how psychology would perhaps approach this. <clears throat> we understand that a child is born, and any parents listening to this, this is very interesting to take note of. A child is born. The child has to be nourished and maintained. You know, that means the forces of life have to preserve the intelligence. And what that means is, for example, the guardians, the uh, parental figures of the child, raise the child. They spoon-feed it baby food, they call it a name, and they constantly acknowledge it by its name. And as the child gets access to behavior, it will eventually behave. It will not behave as the behavior, but it will be influenced by the data. So this child opens its eyes and waves of data hit it. For me, the way I, my, my, my ideas are classified, they're classified in waves of data, moments where the world occurred in that way. And to, in some sense, chain the future to the past is a denial of the present freedom. So the child is not just spoon-fed by its parents, it is then spoon-fed by the world, society, every experience, what sort of data was exposed to it, how it went through various moments in life, and how aware, how self-aware the child is. And psychologists, some of them say that by the age of 14, the child has individualized. It's as if the kid is not just a, a, a foolish kid, then from the foolishness of a kid, the, the child evolves into an independent person, but but still a, a, a dependent person. So think of it this way. Uh, the child's mindset must develop into a, a person that can ac acknowledge the factors that are maintaining it. You know, so parents that see a child that don't acknowledge them, it's a sort of, it does break their heart, but it also means that the child's attention is occupied by certain factors. Now, what occupies the attention, this is how the free will animates itself towards its excitement. So what that means is the child's excitement is based on the unknown. And I, some people I've heard, they talk about writer's block. You know, and I'll tell you, writer's block, you know why that happens? Because the person thinks they know. <laughs> Anytime you feel you don't know something, the, 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 the content, the abstract content manifests instantaneously. <clears throat> so when you have an unknown relationship with your mind, life gets a different flow of movement compared to when you have a known relationship with, with the world. That means the person who know, feels they know something, they feel they have to know it all the time. Do you see that for them, it's as if a thought, they have comprehended the design of a thought well, but they, they, they have allowed, they have not realized the vow, like they, that thought has become a blindfold for them on. The thought has remained so long where it, because it's unnecessary, it occupies the attention and brings in efficiency. Trust me, it's very easy. You can, you can live a whole day without having any thought. It's just how your attention is aligned. Or in some sense, what sort of content it is aligned to. Is it material content or is it immaterial content? Subjective data is immaterial content. It is, it is kept uh, based on the attention's ability to subjectify itself. And so the mind's exploration is in some sense uh, how the body moves uh, with w as what it is. Elon Musk, there's a story about him, which I think it's a nice story. He's shared it in one of his interviews, where Elon Musk says when he was a kid, he was afraid of the dark. 
<clears throat> and when he was afraid of the dark, he eventually read and realized it's an absence of photons. And so the fear went away, suggesting a lot of times fear comes to us because it is the story we feel we're stuck in or we have to keep telling ourselves. And there were environments, honestly, guys, I, my whole existence is to rekindle the school of Athens. I think my whole life will be dedicated then to creating some sort of headquarters of uh, influential debates. I want to see human beings be challenged, but challenged in playful ways where the both challengers in some sense, their contributions, their energetic expressions have a value to the whole uh, audience. So in some sense, we want gladiator arenas of the mind. And that's what I feel I'm going to call it probably School of Athens 2.0. I don't know. <laughs> but like, <clears throat> I, I've had various names approach me for it. But, it but, in, but in some sense, life is, has a beauty that is only found when the unknown keeps the known. For me, I've walked on, <laughs> there's been moments where I've walked on the street and I've seen uh, the physical appearance of a girl that was so beautiful in that moment for me, where it was as if I'm like, how is, how is that girl beautiful to me right now? And I realized that it's because there was something unknown that suddenly became known. Like when you see a beautiful sunset, it's like it was unknown. Your mind had not uh, witnessed such an image. And suddenly your mind witnesses that image. But then there's also moments where I'll tell you where the mind runs ahead of the body. That means your mind shapes the world before the world actually is revealed through a sort of present experience. That means the person lives in their future uh, before they've reached their future. And when they live in their future, before they've reached their future, it's, it's funny because it, 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 is, it is not 100% efficient. It is probably like 32% efficient when you live in the future. Uh, but when you live in the present, that's when it becomes 100% efficient because there are no limits. The limits have not been revealed yet. The person is not assuming ability. They're just living present and their engagement becomes their ability. How you engage with life, how the world turns before you turn it. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Um, this wouldn't be a Mr. Within Talk if I don't share like a story, like a deep story. <laughs> And I'm trying to right now locate which story would be good. Let me think. Um, I'm going to share with you the story of the Tower of Babylon. The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babylon is this ancient story that all humanity somehow was united under one language. As humanity was united under one language, it began constructing, all human beings, all of humanity began designing a tower that was reaching the heavens. They wanted to reach the levels of the God as if all humanity got together and they're like, okay, what do we do? Let's get to the higher dimensions. And so they were building this tower to get to the uh, clouds where the gods were standing in some sense and staring at man. And in that moment, <clears throat> human beings their efficient their efficiency is so incredible when they are all under one language that they eventually get 
this tower so high that the gods are like, oh my god, these guys are climbing up. <laughs> and the gods, uh, one of them is about to throw in some sense a lightning bolt to break this tower. And in that moment, a smarter god comes to this god and says, hey god. <laughs> he says, hey buddy, don't, you don't need to break their tower with lightning. I'll show, you how, uh, I'll show you a classier way to handle it. And what the god does is it makes, this god makes man's language. The gods make man, in some sense, stops the, all the human beings who are building this tower speak different languages. They separate their unified reality. They separate their unified reality. And the moment human beings can't speak the same language, they can't work together. Suddenly, that peak momentum of efficiency, united under one language, breaks into many languages with various forces trying to... So in some sense, they can never build that tower again. And in some sense, the world was separated. So at just like how we can take this metaphor of all human beings in the story of Babel speaking one language, building this one tower to the one truth, in some sense, suddenly the truth, <laughs> the one truth in some sense broke. Broken, And what that means is human beings right now in the evolutionary position that we find ourselves in 2019, is what is it? The, the people, the nations are separated. People are speaking different languages which means they have access to different views of the same world. And so this is very important because right now we are in the aftermath of the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel. And so what shall we do? And I, in some sense, conceive that we have to find the global language and the global language is geometrical. This is Mr. Within's, like I'm saying this, I feel no one else. Uh, exist to say it. Uh, uh, you know, the next great, I've said this before, you don't know how, how, how much I've, I've written about the mystical value of geometry in my lifetime, but it's like, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of my writings are unpublished. Thanks to society's demands of economical survival. <laughs> The same way that a person plays a video game and the video game character has no awareness of the person playing the video game in front of the TV screen, uh, yet that video game character exists in a world, in a world that it is designed. <laughs> and so me, in some sense, suggesting this, sorry guys, I, I, I entertained a very unique subjective landscape a second ago, but um, uh, <laughs> so, so we, are, we are broken up. This one mirror of truth has shattered into many pieces and so many people have various beliefs of the true nature of this existential phenomena. Uh, what, what, the next level, what is required is to simply see that we are in some sense, designers uh, by nature. That means we're not just designed phenomena creatures, creatures that in some sense are alive to a certain design, but we in some sense, this design, evolutionary design, has evolved to a point where now it has become a designer of itself. So this character in the video game is looking at everything in that video game, is looking at that world it's in and suddenly being like, oh my God, it has such design. Suddenly, this character, like if you imagine this video game character was a yogi, this video game character suddenly realizes it is not the programmer. It is a manifestation in the program. And therefore, imagine this video game character suddenly realizes it is the person standing in front of the TV screen holding that remote. Suddenly you realize the end of life, the end of the story of that life. So that video game character is never a video game character. It is the character, it is the person who has the remote control. And what we find for now is that we don't know. This is the agnostic position. This is the agnostic approach. Many people feel agnostics are just lazy. <laughs> lazy or just scared, you know, or confused. You know? <laughs> but I'll tell you, the agnostic mindset is simply the dwelling uh, and the pondering upon the simulation of the truth. 
This world is incredible. It hasn't awoken into its mind. People's minds are closed. They're too closed. They're closed based on programs, cultural programs, historical programs. And when I say a program, a program is not just something uh, that it's like we are a technology of our own design when we act upon our beliefs. The dance of darkness and light. The glory of the yin yang symbol is an infinitude. And I have said this often. I've said I saw a version of the yin yang symbol when I first saw it and got a sense of its relationship that each circle of the yin yang symbol is another circle. And in each of those circles, there's another circle. And there's this sort of infinitude uh, of vision that arises once the present considers the past, which can have potentially be various futures. So we have to study the language that is in some sense being the limits of our world. Ludwig Wittgenstein, he's, he, Wittgenstein, like guys, you don't understand, every country has had great philosophers because it's had people who've wondered about what, what life means in that moment. And because they have wondered what life means, they're like, oh my God, we have to care for life because how else would we even be able to see it? For me, do you know what poverty is? Do you know when I see a poverty commercial on uh, TV, do you know why my heart cries? It cries because I have seen the denial of the efficiency of their minds. A child dying in poverty, that child could be an, a, the next Einstein, but it is dying. It is dying because of ignorance. And not because of ignorance, because there's two types of ignorance. There is nature's ignorance. That means nature did not make us perfect. And so there is imperfections. There are idioms that say to, uh, to mistake, is, uh, to err is to be human. And so the human has access to many errors. When I see uh, that poverty-stricken situation, a part of the world where there is a denial, do you know how many geniuses based on their bad neighborhoods have been pulled into chaos? And they've been defined by it. And that is the tragedy. There's, again, an inner tragedy and an outer tragedy. The outer tragedy is that you, you, you have, in some sense, uh, uh, been taken by the program of the external. The inner tragedy is when you have been taken by just one inner program. And so one inner linguistic program. And it's like we have not, it's like we're playing in a playground, which we have not dare explore why we're playing in it. This life for Chang Su, the Zen master, the Zen master one day wakes up and he just sees meditating. I'll say it like this. Let me start the story off like this. There's this dojo. There's this dojo, Zen kind of dojo. And in the Zen dojo, The disciples of this Zen temple monastery wake up, this Zen monastery that's on top of the mountains, you know? <clears throat> and in some sense, what happens is the disciples wake up and suddenly they notice, uh, oddly unlike any other day, their, the Zen master, their Zen master Chung Su, it's as if he's had a dream that he woke up from and ever since he had that dream, he's just he's come and stood like on the side of the temple gazing at the canyon, you know? And so they go and they see their Zen master, this person, the head, 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 um, the head awareness of the temple is in some sense the headmaster of the temple who goes by this name Chang Su. 
he's he's in some sense troubled and sitting in a very uh, odd meditative position as if he's not meditating he's dwelling on what 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 everything means now and so the disciples gather around in this early morning where the sky is uh, bluish going from dark to blue and they come to chung su and they're like chung su <coughs> what's up <laughs> and chung su looks at his disciples and he's like guys i had a dream last night and in this dream, I dreamt I was a butterfly. I really, in that dream, I was having the real experience of being a butterfly. And then I woke up. And when I woke up, I had this existential philosophical dilemma to see, am I a butterfly dreaming I'm a man, I'm a Zen master, or am I a Zen master dreaming I'm a butterfly? And his disciples all sat down beside him. It's like, holy shit, that's like, that's so supremely, it's such a, a deep challenge, such a profound kind of um, um, mental confrontation. And so that story, guys, I have no idea how Chung Su kind of like went on after that. <laughs> but I could tell you, for me, if Mr. Within was there, I would ask Chung Su a question. And I would ask Chung Su how he could be two things in one moment. Which in some sense would imply that the moment does not have the attributes of the dimensions it finds itself in. That means Chang Su either was a Zen master dreaming he was a butterfly, either was a butterfly dreaming he was a Zen master, or was the presence of the moment regardless of the content in it. Marcus Aurelius has this quote where he says the soul is dyed with the color of its thoughts. And the word dyed, I, I, like, you know, to, to an audience that don't, doesn't know what that word means, that it, dyed is like colored, okay? In some sense, you dye clothing, uh, you know? And so anyways, anyways, the soul is colored, is dyed with the colors of its thoughts, with the colors of its thought, with the color of its thoughts. And as attention finds a contentment with its presence, it attains the ultimate. You see, the ultimate is, is not in the doership factor. This is why truth, in some sense, if it's storied, it can only be an intermediary. And, and when you look at this book called Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is an incredible uh, uh, design of lit lit literature. It's an incredible book. And in this book, we find a situation where uh, a warrior, one of the greatest archers of the time, in, in that story, in some sense, he, is, he has to combat, his, he has to fight his own family. He has to fight his own family. And in that moment, he's choosing not to. He's as if part of the other kingdom and his family members are in that kingdom, you know. And so he's decided not to fight. And the story is that God comes to him. God comes to Arjuna, this archer. <clears throat> and as God comes to Arjuna... God has this dialogue with Arjuna that is, becomes the Bhagavad Gita. It's a dialogue between man and God. There is a moment where in the Bhagavad Gita it says, now, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, but I'm going to tell you that in the Bhagavad Gita, there's chapters where it says uh, God is answering Arjuna's, the, all of Arjuna's questions, as if Arjuna had suddenly had the uh, presence of God there, and our, uh, God is asking Arjuna questions.
In the Bhagavad Gita, it says, if a person chooses to follow uh, a, a separate god, like what, uh, like um, as if uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's entertained that existence is like the world. The world of man is like the bottom of a mountain of this multi-dimensional mountain, and beyond, on the top of this mountain, is like the higher dimensions where gods exist. You know, and so. In some sense, Krishna has come to Arjuna, Krishna, the god Krishna. Just a second, guys, I need to check something. Yeah, it's Krishna. Anyways, there's this notion that if you follow the path of one God, you will be bound by that God. That celestial higher force, your afterlife will be dependent on that. Okay? But if you focus on the one truth, then your, your attention has moved differently. And trust me, this life is a sort of ceremony of how the attention moves through biological phenomena. This is life, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it, it cannot be storified too much. At the same time, yeah, the stories are helping. They're helping for the collective to be found. Uh, Carl Jung, in his teachings, he speaks about, uh, <clears throat> in, in some sense, uh, the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. Yeah. Uh, and what, it, what it's implying is that Right now, right now as I'm speaking, I'll make it simple, right now as I'm speaking, this is my personal consciousness, my words, my actions and free will, it's happening in my waking state and it's happening where there's a personal consciousness, okay? This personal consciousness turned on the talk and the live stream and all da 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 da. So there's a personal consciousness here. Now this, if, if I am a person and I have a consciousness, a bubble of knowledge, a bubble of awareness, then there is in some sense, the personal unconscious. So in some sense, the unknown aspects of my mind. Okay, and then when I see my body and when I see uh, in this personal consciousness, there's this physical embodiment and this physical embodiment is part of a civilization, is part of a sort of the tribal dynamics have, have in some sense uh, reached their peak evolution in regards to becoming the sophistication of how social groups are organized in, in, in this, in, on, on this rock in the middle of nowhere, you know? <laughs> so we have to kind of wonder, what is the value? If reality is unknown, then knowledge can run free. If knowledge can run free, if it's going to see... Okay, here, let me not walk too astray. Let's get back to the personal conscious. So, so the, as I am, a, there's this. I'm a person, and I'm conscious. Then I see there is my my person's unconscious, the personal unconscious. And if there is a personal unconscious, instantly there implies there's even a geometrical relationship. You can see in his thoughts, it looks like an L, you know. <clears throat> and so, the personal conscious wonders about the personal unconscious. As the personal conscious wonders about the personal unconscious, it sees its unconscious could imply a collective dimension. This implication of a collective dimension has to be considered. It's one of those things where there is one symptom to the illness of the person, and so the doctor's like, okay, let's check it right away. You know, it's one of those things. So instantly, the explorative vision of Carl Jung suddenly saw the uh, collective unconscious. Now, this collective unconscious is so profound because it is an opportunity. And this was something that the philosophers saw how religion was in some sense being dismantled too quickly before being studied. And it's not just about, like, I won't just validate uh, Jordan Peterson's point of trying to keep alive that sort of cultural ethos. You know, that story has become part of people's lives. You deny that story, you're denying parts of their life. 
so there will be war till the end of time and it's not about denying people it's just comprehending how we can walk in this changing world with the glorious efficiency that our great 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 grandchildren and the future generations will look back and they're like our pioneers uh, look at our ancestors look at how they lived they lived in confusion yet their clarity spoke louder So this would mean that if there is a collective unconscious, there is a conch, there is a, a collective consciousness, a collective conscious dimension. This collective conscious dimension was introduced through religion to people, but it was introduced in a strange way where they're like, God has no partner, but God is within all things and everywhere and is in some sense the ultimate awareness. Okay. That means uh, certain people ask, uh, you know, uh, in like uh, the prophet, uh, what is the soul? And some people wondered about what is like. I even went to like a mosque and I asked a certain person there, uh, what is the? Um, oh God, what did I say? I asked them, uh, what is the notion of the soul in Islam? And the person told me the notion of the soul Ooh. The response came that in the Quran it is said that the soul is the secret of God. And there are certain hadiths that I don't know if they're authenticated or not, but certain hadiths that... Um, that suggested that the Prophet gave a response that the, uh, the soul had ranks. And it was a sort of militaristic kind of ranking system. But because I, guys, just because I'm using the word militaristics, uh, militaristic, don't have an uh, ignorant view. An idea is not is harmless. It is the actions that the idea evokes, and it is also the active responses. So action is occurring from both sides. It's occurring from, in some sense, uh, the judge and the guilty. You know, and so the judge ha is ha is acting, and so is the guilty acting, and so in some sense we, we are in some sense in a position where we wonder about the dynamics of personality, and when the dimension of a changing world is considered, it is too complex to position. So what that means is every moment is like how knowledge is being created in the unknown, and this knowledge being created in the unknown, it can have it can have various outlooks, but in some sense uh, we must not worry it's like um law is there to conduct the action of the being but not the thoughts of the being there is no law that can limit your mind this is why we have freedom of speech that means there is freedom of people to view life in any way they like. We're not here to force all of people all of humanity's eyes in one way, but we have to be considerate of the actions because thoughts thoughts are like how can i tell you thoughts are like the permission slips for an action anyways the notion was that it's this multidimensional hierarchy of uh maturity of uh awareness to reality okay and so it's an unknown factor it's a secret that the truth cannot be known by that which is in the simulation So what I'm trying to say is there's so much unknown stuff and we're like a young species that has just opened its eyes in the world. If I could give our species 
maturity and age, I would say we're five years old as a species. That means we, we are behaving with uh, a, a lack of awareness to how our attention is being the design and designing life. We, have, we, have, we don't have tolerance for various ideas because we've decided to only build, on, build up on, on a few. When I was in Iran at the age of seven, I, I remember I would, in some sense, go to my grandmother's house, and my grandmother and grandfather were uh, religious people. My grandfather was a businessman, so <laughs> religion for him was his ethics, in some sense. And uh, my grandmother was at home, and she was religious, and she would pray, and she had these beads, and she would constantly move these beads, like a rosary in her hand, a, a, a tasbih, and she would constantly be saying these prayers. She was praying. And I remember seeing this as a kid. And uh, my grandmother is, was the nicest person I knew. One of, one of the most incredible, like, she, every, in this lifetime, I've only seen niceness from her. Never a moment of anger in front of me and my brother, when I, when, like in, in this lifetime. It's incredible. And when I um, uh, when we were there and she had this prayer thing, I remember me and my brother, we wanted to kind of like, uh, you know, we were kind of bored in some sense. And so we asked for the same thing, rosaries, and we started to kind of try to say prayer. And then eventually as kids, we got bored and, <laughs> and we went and did something else. But I remember it was very crucial because that sparked a question in my mind that there is God here. And yet this God requires its creation to signal it. And for me, I wondered about, later on, throughout the years, I wondered about the implications of what I saw in my childhood. And I recognized the magnificence of the unknown movements of nature that I have access to my eyes only. And this is the trouble some aspect of judgment, as if uh, certain people have kind of uh, spoken about it in this way, where they've said that um, the man goes to heaven and God is there. And the person is like, uh, so let me say it like this, the person finds himself at heaven's entrance, and when he finds himself at heaven's entrance, he says to, uh, the person says, you can go into heaven, and this man says, no. How can, I, how, can that, how can I go into heaven when my family and all those I know on this earth are in some sense, how can I go to heaven when my species is, is in some sense in its own hell? So in some sense, the question is, is our completion and our perfection enough only, only enough? Is that it? Or do we need to redesign, literally for, just not have the past? Uh, it's like we're not trying to change the past. We're not trying to even change the present that much. We're just saying, hey, present civilization, let's all just slow down for a second and wonder about if we can create an additional dimension without having to change this world. That means there's a way to change this world without changing it, but with the consideration of the way we're changing it is we're creating a dimension where we're trying to redesign a global community, a global sort of uh, a behavioral system, as if this would be one of those things where uh, if Mr. Within's voice was heard <laughs> uh, uh, by, by people you know, in power, I would say this, it, it initiates something where the greatest visionaries. Visionary doesn't mean, it uh, doesn't have to do with uh, your intelligence. It has to do with how, your, how much your intelligence, uh, it, it has to do with what your intelligence sees. A visionary is, is, is inspired by vision. That's what I'm saying. You want to see something happen. By all those people who they recognize, okay, my lifetime's gonna end. We're all candles here. So what do we do? And while the light burns bright, we must, in some sense, as <laughs> uh, what's his name, uh, <laughs> D Dylan Thomas, uh, as Dylan Thomas says, we must 
in some sense, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. In some sense, fight for the collective efficiency. Fight for how the collective conscious can manifest itself. We are temporary, yet our vision, like what is evolution? It is the eternal uh, urge of, of uh, temporary phenomena to continue. Immortality is, a fant is an eternal fantasy. And, here, and hence, I am saying, we, we might be in the process of evolution, but the process of evolution seems to be an eternal expression of the universal sector. It's a wave that we all find ourselves to be particles swimming in. You know, <laughs> that's the intelligence of reality. And so once we first have to, once we have to get to the collective conscious, once we get to the collective conscious, then the collective unconscious could occur. Then we realize uh, it's not that we should wait for extraterrestrial contact. Our vision and awareness amplifies where we notice how empty the room is, this cosmic room is. And when the minds of men, the minds of mankind roar, that's when we are no longer defined by our individuality, but by our collective efforts. Suddenly, the civilization could be structured playfully as something where the child doesn't have to go look for a job. He sees quests. He sees various problems that various organizations have, and whoever contributes to it can earn. Do you see? And so it's, it's, it, it's the stories we tell ourselves that define the limits of our innovation. Ludwig Wittgenstein, I'll reemphasize, he says, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So the world is as limited as how we are uh, conceptualizing it. And so the conceptual axis can change, but the axis of the planet cannot change. So we have to honor the objective given data, but we have to also honor the f creative freedom of the uh, navigation and maneuverance of the subjective data. So the subjective realm must be as honored as the objective realm needs to be. Behavior comes and goes. Behavior is on a response, uh, is, is response space. And what that means is that right now you are living in an ecosystem. You are not only influenced by how you consider the ecosystem, but also how the ecosystem actually is. And when you're part of an ecosystem, that means you're part of it. You're like literally your eyes have opened in a movement that already had intentions before your intentions arise. So what can you do when you are in the house of God? You just, you know, respectfully take off your shoes you abide with nature's laws yet your free will can maneuver through the addition of new dimensions you must let go of the past to see a new future but you must let go of it in a way you must let go of the inefficient aspects of it Evolved efficiency, of course, must be taken care of. What that means is that his, our history is known to have many lost technologies, many, many uh, incredibly efficient uh, technologies that were not relayed. They were not passed down properly. When the world opens its eyes, man's vision is how we built paradise on earth, how we brought heaven down rather than we went up. What that means is we realize the nature of our intelligence and then we abided by the true nature and we're not distracted too much by conceptual data. This flow is serene. I spoke to a very, uh, what I consider an enlightened person and uh, this person was in India, of course. And uh, <laughs> I asked him a question on Facebook, you know. Uh, in, in Facebook chat, like in like, uh, our voices were person to person, and and so in that moment, I asked them, uh, "What is does free will exist?" And he came to me and said, in some sense, he said he gave a very complex response, of course, like not complex, but a very down to earth response. And he said something where. He's like, I am at a point where I appreciate my being. And I was like, it was such an incredible sentence because I knew its value. How many human beings, they don't even care how they're being right now. 
it's very important. For me, I've had moments where I've cared about my body more than my mind. Till 2011, I was born in 1991. In, in 2000, till 2011, I was just a bewildered beast, like, like you know, all, all creatures on this planet. You know, our bewilderment has now just become more civilized. You know, but the bewilderment is the same intensity. It's as if we are, we are not uh, thrown into chaotic awe uh, just by, you know, uh, physical uh, phenomena. We're also struck by on by the implications of the, sub, uh, of the subjective depth of this uh, physical phenomena. And so that was the conclusion. And so the person told me there is free will, yet there is a free will in a greater free will. And I was like, okay, so, you know. We've all freed will. <laughs> will is no longer imprisoned, you know. William can go back to his home, you know. <laughs> Language gives architecture, gives uh, depth to objective phenomena. This depth becomes the personality's life. And when you can come into contentment, you can learn to appreciate how life is being and not have too much, few, not wanted to be too defined by the future or the past because the moment you play around with the future and the past, you're not in objective reality. When I say you're not in objective reality, that means you're not in the present moment. Like your attention is to a very version of the present moment, which is like uh, glasses you're wearing, you know, shades you're wearing, looking at trying to look at the stars at night. Language is a technology. Doesn't mean a person has to be in their car every moment of their life. It doesn't mean you have to be a per sort of a limited construct of a subjective, uh, whatever's in your, whatever th subjects are in your attention at that moment. Study the nature. Study the direct experience uh, of the nature of the being. For the greatest type of freedom is a freedom that was always there. Much blessings and namaste. Live for what is alive. It will not lead you astray. Much blessings and all this thing.